A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I begin in Allah's name, the Beneficent, the Merciful. And I welcome you all on this auspicious occasion of Eid al Ghadir. As you know, it is, uh, it is a, a profound moment by which we recognize this very, very important day uh, in which the leadership that has been divinely ordained from Adam onwards uh, was given from the finality of prophethood into the new dimension of the imamat that will continue till the day of judgment. And I think it's very important for us as an audience to understand the nature of divine leadership and the importance of this day upon which the public appointment of Imam Ali alayhi salam as a confirmation of what was already done numerous times prior to the, the event of Ghadir was done so that the followers and the believers understand the gravity by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insists upon the verse in Surah An-Nisa, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Inshallah, we're going to have a dialogue today with Haj Ali Khalfan and Brother Amil Unia uh, in discussing the importance of divine leadership. And we're going to quote quite a few Quranic verses as evidence not only of its importance, but the consequence of ignoring its importance. As you know that the purpose of leadership is not so that leaders can be recognized and just be given honor. Leadership is built around the premise that they become the means and a guidance for us all to become better human beings and get proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens is that when individuals ignore that responsibility, and those individuals are the components of the larger social circles, what happens then is that the society starts to also suffer as a result of that. And if there's a larger collection of people who are oblivious of their responsibilities, then what it does is that it uh, creates problems for our growth, our spirituality, which then leads to our own self-destruction. So in today's discussion is essential because it's going to talk about, uh, the, the, the focus is going to be entirely on why leadership is important and what does it have in terms of consequences in terms of our day-to-day -day transactions, as well as the most important conversation of all is, how does it improve us? How does it make us better people? Because when you have good leadership, then you have a template by which to follow. And if the society recognizes that divine ordinance, of course, then it becomes even more prevalent that the society at large will become more God conscious. And what I mean by more God conscious is that therefore the levels of evil and the rejections of good will diminish. And I think that's very important. You know, a great sage was once asked uh, by a simple person that what can I do to achieve high stations uh, in this world and in the next world? What can I do to achieve that? And the sage, the, the Arif, simple response was avoid the haram don't indulge in haram acts but to avoid the haram it implies that the society at large needs to only provide us and give us um, ways and means by which it's conducive to god consciousness and submission becomes easy hijab for example if the norm in society is modesty if the norm in society is modesty for men and women then it's much easier to practice modesty. But if the norm in society is immodesty, it's debauchery and misogyny and a lot of what we call indecency, then it's much harder for the average human being to practice religion. So leadership is where everything starts from. Adam was the first leader placed on earth. He was the first human being and his wife. And you find that they, and he was also the first leader. So not only were they the first human beings, but they were also the first leaders of humanity, both male and female. You find how was the mother of all and what she did and what uh, her behavior would ultimately impact the whole of society if we're not careful. So inshallah, I'm going to ask Haj Ali Khalfan to join in and Brother Amil also, and uh, we'll get started. So the question I want to ask Brother Ali Ajali Khalfan is, I know you are very passionate about wilaya. You've given many, many presentations. I know Allama Taba Tabai is, is very, very strong in that position from the Quranic perspective. 
and um, and you've spoken quite a lot on that. So first question to you is, uh, how important is it uh, from the perspective of the divine uh, ordinance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, thank you very much. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. And Eid uh, al-Ghadir Mubarak to all of you as well. Uh, and thank you for having me in this uh, very important uh, discussion about uh, divine guardianship. I, I would call it divine guardianship because leadership, according to my understanding of the term wilaya in the Quran, the leadership that we commonly talk about, which is imama, comes under the umbrella of wilaya. So it's not a separate thing. It's part and parcel of wilaya. If there is no wilaya, there is no leadership. Now, when we speak about wilaya, we find that the Quran clearly proves, and this is the perspective that I want to discuss, because look, I can go straight into uh, the verse of proclamation. You know, Ya uh, Rasul, ma unzila You know, most of us know that verse. We can prove the appointment of Imam Ali is the wali from, from that verse, of course. But let's consider this different perspective, you know, because I had a discussion with a brother, a respected brother from the Ahl al Sunnah uh, school of thought. And I won't tell you what he told me at the end because it was not something good. But nevertheless, when he saw the proof from the Quran, uh, he started calling me names. You know, and it shows it showed very clearly that uh, he did not have anything to argue after the proof. So the first thing which is very important is to to see the proof from the Quran that so long as there is a single believer existing on the earth, there is a necessity to provide divine guardianship to even one believer. And this is a verse that I'm going to recite, and I'm sure all everyone knows this verse because it's the uh, the verse from the Ayatul Kursi. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Allahu waliyul ladina amanu yukhrijhum min al dulumati in al nur." Allahu waliyul ladina amanu. We need to understand the verse very carefully. Allah is the wali of the believers. Now here, Allah does not say. He is the wali of every human being, which shows, therefore, that there's two types of guardianship. There is the general guardianship, and there is that particular guardianship. Here, the verse is talking about that particular guardianship, which is incumbent upon Allah, on the believers. As the verse says, Allahu waliyu ladina amanu, yukhrijuhum min al-dulumati ila nur. Yukhrijuhum min al-dulumati ila nur means it gives us the function of this wilaya. What is the function of the wilaya? Is to guide the believers from darkness to light. Now we know, I'm sure all the Muslims know that anything coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not come to us directly. It has to be channeled. Now this wilaya that Allah is talking about, which is incumbent upon himself, is has to be channeled. A channeled through whom? At that time, when the verse was revealed, obviously it has to be channeled to, through our messenger, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. And the proof is in chapter number 65, verse number 11, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rasulain yatlu alaykum ayatillahi mubayyinad liyukhrija alladina amanu wa amilu salihad minad dhulumati ila nur. What is Allah saying? A messenger who recites to you the communication, the clear communications of Allah, so that this messenger may bring forth who? Who is Allah talking about? The ones who believe and do good deeds from darkness to light. So here the proof is that the wilayah of Allah is now channeled through someone who is a representative of Allah. And at that time, it is none other than our prophet, based on this verse. And the question then is, what happens? We have already proven now that 
relying upon the believers is necessary, managing their affairs. So once people have become believers, they brought Iman, they brought, they've submitted, and then they have brought Iman, then the guardianship comes into the picture because their affairs have to be managed. You know, when you talk about uh, political affairs, you talk about uh, spiritual affairs, you talk about economic affairs, social affairs, all kinds of affairs that the believers are engaged in comes under this wilaya. So here's the question now, and this is the question I asked to the brother. What happens when the prophet passes away? Does the wilaya end there at the same time with the passing away of the prophet? If you say yes, then you are contradicting the Quran because Quran clearly shows that wilaya is necessary even if there is a single believer on the earth. So this wilaya therefore now has to be channeled through someone else. And the answer then is who is, or rather the question is, who is this person? It has to be a person like the prophet in every right. sense, except that he is not going to be a prophet and a messenger, but now he's going to be the wali after the prophet. And that is why the Allah is now saying to the prophet when he was coming back from his farewell pilgrimage, Ya yuhar rasul, ballir ma unzila ilayk min rabbi, wa in lam taf'al, fa ma ballagta risalata. Or Prophet, convey not something which was just revealed, convey that which was revealed. Means the appointment of Amir al-Mu'mineen as the Wali of Allah was already appointed, was already done by Allah. But Allah gave the Prophet, our Prophet, the discretion of when to convey the message. Because there was a reason why he didn't want to convey the message right away. And then we come to... Yeah. The, the verse in Surah Maida, when Allah says, uh, uh, This is how the religion of Islam became perfect. And Allah completed his favor upon the believers. And it is none other than the favor of Wilayah. Now, be, before this verse, before this sentence in verse number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mm. Today the disbelievers have lost all hope. Allah is addressing the Prophet. Have lost all hope in your religion. Allah wa ta'ala answers the question, what was the hope that the disbelievers had on the religion of Islam? And mm. the only hope they had was that they tried to fight the Prophet in not less than 88 battles in order to kill him. And that's how they were going to extinguish the light of Islam. But Allah so, shattered their hopes. So by, yeah. Let me jump in really quickly, Ali. First point, and then you can continue. Sure. With reference to the importance of wilaya. Yes. The importance of wilaya. Okay, I mean, if you examine uh, the five major schools of thought between Sunni and Shia, you have five major schools of thought. Besides the the extras that are, you know, sort of offshoots of these, right? Five major. And you find that fiqhi-wise, we're probably 90, 95% similar when it comes to the rules, regulations, and so on. We're about 90, 95% similar, right? But you notice we have a, a difference of opinion. We have a dispute. And the dispute is primarily about the leadership that follows the messenger of Allah. So if you look at today, 2 billion Muslims on earth Right, either either because they are sort of fragmented in some shape, way, or form within this greater umbrella called Islam, where you now you have to take which school of thought do you belong to? You, you know, you can call yourself a Muslim, but you have to follow, you know, the, the uh, one of these uh, schools, right? And what you find is that we all agree that the necessity of leadership after the Prophet is what is causing all this problem. So to understand the gravity when Allah says, ma unzila it is so heavy, it is so profound that if you and I have any doubts about this commandment of Allah that Ya Yur Rasul Balik, you know, verse 67 of Surah mm -hmm. Al-Ma'idah, then, then we, we have really forgotten the, the gravity of this important event, Al-Ghadir. But continue, you were saying something. Yes. So, you know, based on what you just said, Brother Hassanin, Allah when he does the tafsir of 
Ya Yuhur Rasul, Balik Ma Unzila. He mentions that there is a profound statement here, an ultimatum, meaning it is so important that if the Prophet were not to convey this message, whatever the message is for the time being, we leave it aside, mm -hmm. then it is as if he has not conveyed any mm -hmm. message of Islam. Mm -hmm. So Allah, the way he describes this verse is so interesting. He says, if you look at the religion of Islam with all its messages, it's like a, a, a new a fabric. And within the fabric, there is a nucleus. If you remove that nucleus, the whole fabric is dismantled. Right. And that's the meaning of that verse. What is the nucleus? He asks the question. And he proves from the Quran that the nucleus has to be the wilaya after the Prophet, which has to be added to the religion in order to make the religion perfect. Now, when Allah mentioned in the Quran, the verse that I recited, how did Allah, the question is, how did Allah shatter the hopes of the disbelievers? Because the only hope they had now was they were waiting for the Prophet to die a natural death. Okay, but the way Allah shattered their hopes was to appoint someone like him right. in every sense. You know, even in the Eid al which we are going to celebrate next week, I think. Okay, you see that the Prophet brings with him his close family members, and who are they? They are Fatima al Zahra, his daughter, uh, Amir al Mu'minin, his son in law, and his cousin, and Hassan and Hussein, because these five are the five who represent Tawheed. You know, when they were having the, the discussion yeah. with the Christians of Najran, it was only the discussion was about Tawheed and nothing else. Right. So the, the claim of Allah in Tawheed is the same as the claim of Rasulullah and these four members of his family. So it's so important that Allah then were, was to appoint someone like the Prophet to take his position, not as a prophet and a messenger, but as the wali of the believers. And that is, this is how he completed his favors upon the believers. And this is how the religion of Islam became perfect. And by the way, if you look, even you'll notice that all five schools of thought quote people after the prophet for the impact they had towards the deen, right? People say the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, right? They they follow them too and they quote them. I mean, all, all five schools of thought, they quote uh, companions and so on. But you will notice that they all pivot on those very critical personalities that Allah has chosen. For when you look at companions, when you look at Tabi'een, they're not necessarily to be trusted, right? Because they're not endowed exactly. or protected by Allah. So the wilaya principle is the nucleus that maintains the, the, the direction, the purity, and the clarity of role modelship, right? So this right. conversation here is completely, it boils down to the fact that we want to become good human beings. We want to be compassionate. We want to be truthful. We want to be honest. We want to be caring, sharing, loving, giving, all of the above. How do we do that? Allah says, in kuntum tuhibun Allah, fattabi'uni. Obey the messenger of Allah. So the messenger now is leaving, and exactly what you said, Brother Ali, is that Allah has shattered their desire to obfuscate Islam. And in this verse, by the way, Ya Rasul, Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik, Allah says, Wallahi asimuka minan nas. So Allah will protect you, meaning there's a threat here. This is yeah. not about just general distribution. What do you have to say, Brother Ahmed? Thank you. Yeah, it's been a very uh, interesting discussion and dialogue on this concept and this great occasion, really, of uh, Eid al Ghadir. Um, and I think Imam Sadiq has a beautiful hadith, you know, about this day of Ghadir and, and he quotes it as being the most significant Eid for the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Because if you look at the, you know, the other Eids that we have, for example, Eid al-Fitr, we notice that Eid al-Fitr um, denotes the completion of the month of Ramadan, a month of fasting. And so we celebrate, you know, the sacrifices we made during this month and the fasting that we did during this month. And if we look at Eid al-Adha, for example, we celebrate, you know, the completion of the ritual of Hajj and then the sacrifices that were made during that period and the completion of Hajj. But Eid al-Ghadir, as the Imam states so eloquently, is really the celebration of the perfection of the religion of Allah and the completion of all of God's um, favors onto you and I. So it's the greatest Eid because it's the grandest completion of them all. And that's why Allah says in the verse 
that Brother Ali introduced, and we've been discussing. Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati ni'mati wa raditu lakum al Islama dinan. And it's interesting, by the way, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in this verse, He says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, meaning I have perfected for you your religion. And I've completed my favors upon you. And the, and the ulama, you know, for example, Shahid Mutahri, they all discuss what is the difference between these two qualities, you know, these two terms, akmalta and atmamta, ikmal and itmam. And they say that, for example, Shahid Mutahri states that when you look at ikmal, when Allah says, akmaltu lakum dinakum, it means, you know, perfected your religion, meaning the religion of Islam, in a sense, was complete. Uh, from a ritualistic perspective before, you know, Salah was instituted, Zakah was instituted, all of these facets were instituted, but it was not yet perfect. For example, you know, the, the, the examples many of our scholars give is, that, for example, if you look at a house, if you look at a hospital, right? These institutions, these structures can be complete. For example, you can have a house, you know, that looks very beautiful from the exterior and it's, you know, has very large square footage. It's a beautiful house, but if that house has no, for example, electricity, no power, no gas, the house is not functional. It's not yet perfect. Though it may be complete from the outside, it's not fully functional and perfect. Same way by in a, in a hospital, for example, you can have the most grand hospital created. But if you don't have the right person to lead that hospital, the right doctors to lead that hospital, you can misuse the hospital. You know, if you have some any random person come in, they can look around the hospital and think, you know, well, this makes for a nice storage space, you know, a nice warehouse. Let's let's use this as a warehouse. They don't know how to properly use that institution. So you need that right doctor in charge. You need the right team in there to really make that 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 uh, hospital really functional. So when Allah says, "Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum," I have perfected for you your religion. This marks the perfection of the religion of Islam because this is the day in which Islam becomes fully functional eternally. Not just during the time of the Prophet, but now it's fully functional eternally because now there is a divine guide appointed for eternity. I think you wanted to uh, mention something about this name. No, see, so when you say fully functional, in other words, we understand, for those who may be curious to understand, first and foremost, uh, as a fact, that Islam did not come 1400 years ago. This is a misstatement that is a poison pill thrown in ac academia, in academic institutions. And when people talk about Islam, they say it's the youngest of the Abrahamic faiths. First and foremost, categorically, it is not the youngest of the Abra Abrahamic faiths. Uh, Abraham was a Muslim. Uh, Adam was a Muslim. It is the original faith. It's not the youngest, first of all. And very clearly to understand that the religion of Allah, when it comes to legislation, and when it comes to the do's and don'ts, started with Adam. Correct. So when we talk about perfection, we're talking about completion of that sequence of rules and laws that came through Abraham, through Moses, through Jesus, right, to the major prophets. And of course, the finality of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that continuity in its completion and as a favor of Allah. So you continue, please. Yeah. Right. That's why, by the way, that point you mentioned, that's why at the end of the verse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states, you know, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ that today is the day where I have chosen this Al Islam, meaning the noun of Al Islam was now stamped upon the religion. Right now that the favors have been completed, it's been completely perfect and functional, and the favors of Allah have been completed. Now the term of the noun of Al Islam is now stamped on this day. The term, the noun, meaning the principles, as you mentioned, Islam was there from the beginning. In the in the Allah al Islam, there is no denying that the religion of Allah subhanahu wa taala is al Islam, and that's why even in the Quran we have so many, so many statements of Allah referring to, as you mentioned, Nabi Ibrahim as a Muslim. You know, who was samakum al Muslimin min qabl wa fi hada. He was the foremost of of the Muslimin. Of course, all of the prophets were preaching al Islam. They were Muslimin in the sense that they were submitters to Allah subhanahu wa taala, submitters to Tawheed, submitters to the truth. But this wa raditu lakum al Islam adinan is that final stamp of the noun of al Islam given on this day in honor of this uh, great appointment. And by the way, one one quick point, and brother Ali, I know you want to mention something. One point I want to clarify is, you know, we always say, we always hear people say that on this day, the Holy Prophet appointed Imam Ali alayhi salam as his successor. And I say, no, that's not correct. It's not the Holy Prophet who appointed Imam Ali as his successor. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who appointed 
Imam Ali as the successor of the Holy Prophet. And it is the Prophet who announced that appointment. The Prophet has no jurisdiction to appoint himself. It's not the Prophet who came forth and said, you know what? I think in my own opinion that Imam Ali is the one who's going to uh, succeed me because, you know, he's my son-in-law or he's my cousin or whatever it may be. No, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent the message. Ya Rasul, ballig. It is Allah who makes that appointment. This is a fundamental divine principle in the Quran that I know we're going to discuss. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always. It is only he who has the authority and the jurisdiction to appoint leadership. That's why we titled this program Divine Leadership. Because in the matters of religion, leadership is only appointed by God. He is the only one who has the authority. And we know, of course, the story of Nabi Musa salam and Nabi Harun, right? When Allah commands Nabi Musa to go to Fir'aun, he tells you and your brother, Idhaba ila Fir'aun innahu tagha. Go towards Fir'aun, for he has transgressed. And then Nabi Musa, as we know, he prays, Qala Rabbi shrah li sadri, wa yassir li amri, wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli, wa ja'alni waziram min ahli Haruna akhi. And let me take a wazir from my community, from my family, min ahli Haruna akhi. Aaron, my brother. So even Nabi Musa salam, who already is a prophet of God, who has been commanded to go on a divine mission, even he does not have the authority to say, oh, by the way, Allah, I'm going to take my brother Harun with me in this mission. No, he has to take permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that give me from my family, Aaron, my brother, to assist me in this mission. He has to take that permission. He cannot say, Allah, this is what I'm doing. No, he has to take that permission. So this is a divine principle we must introduce. And Brother Ali, you can jump in here. That yes. it is Allah who appoints. And same with the, the event of Ghadir. It's not the Prophet who appoints. We can say Prophet appointed if we mean that Prophet is the one who declared the appointment. But it was not the Prophet's choice. It was Allah's commandment. And the Prophet declared that appointment. Yes, I, I agree that... Uh... Uh, it's it's Allah's uh, prerogative, you know, to appoint uh, a leader, whether it is a prophet or a messenger or a wali uh, after uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. So I just want to quickly mention the dialogue I had with uh, the brother, and I mentioned this in the beginning. And when I showed him the proof of wilaya from the Quran, he accepted. By the way, he did accept that I agree now that so long as there is a single believer existing on the earth, there has to be wilaya present uh, for that even one, one believer. And later on, he said that as far as the appointment of Amir al-Mu'minin, we do agree because, you know, as you all know, probably that the report about the, Eder, the event of Khadir has been reported more by Sunni uh, uh, narrators than Shia narrators. And this is a fact, by the way, even mentioned in Tafsir al-Mizan, that there are more Sunni narrators of the event of Ghadir than Shia narrators. Now, what does this show? It shows, therefore, that the Prophet did appoint Amir al-Mu'mineen as the wali after him. So the brother accepted that. You know what he told me? Quite opposite to what you said, Brother Amil, that some people say that he was appointed a successor and not the wali. But this particular brother said, I agree he was appointed as the wali, but he was not point, appointed as a successor, khalifa. And therefore, we need a wali and we also need a khalifa. So I, I took my, my argument further and I said to him, I said, do you know Arabic well? He says, yes, I do. I said, what is the root word of wilaya? Explain to me. And he didn't know that. So I explained to him. I said, the root word of wilaya is waliya. And if you look at the vocabulary of the Quran, you know, many people have written about uh, and have written on the vocabulary of the Quran, you will see that waliya means when two things are in close proximity to each other. So therefore, the wali is so close to the believer that no one can come in between. So even if you tell me that we need a successor, that successorship has to be provided by the wali because no one can come in between. This is the meaning of what we lie. And if, you, if we need a leader, then the leader has to, has to come from the umbrella of wilaya. It's the wali who provides leadership. It's the wali who will be the successor. It's the wali who is our social guardian. 
It's the wali who is our spiritual guardian. It's the wali who is everything to do with the believers. And when, when I told him that, and I'm going to mention what he said, he said, you are the Iblis of the Muslims. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Now, let, say, now, let, let, me, let me just jump into that quickly here. You will notice that if we were to say that Imam Ali Alayhi was the wali, but not the Khalifa, as, as was proposed, right? I mean, it's a it's a, what we call a quagmire because it's a catch-22 now. You see, the irony of life in our schools of thought is that all commandments and direction, hence we believe in God and religion, is that it's divinely ordained through his agents who are the prophets and the imams, which is then delivered to the people. Okay, That's a very simplified expression of how the law of God uh, reaches us, right, as, as an indirect uh, method. And, and we know that the entire religion revolves around Allah and His Messenger. Or you believe, do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. For all the religious laws come from Allah and His Messenger. So that's, that's a given. Now we do know that what happens after the Prophet and guardianship and protectorship of what happens after the Holy Prophet is also holistically part and parcel of Islam. So it's absurd for anyone to say that the Holy Prophet appointed Imam Ali as the wali but did not appoint him as a khalifa because then we would argue that no khalifa was ever appointed. Here's a catch-22 now. Yeah. If a khalifa was not appointed by Allah and his messenger, then we don't need it because if we need it, it's bid'ah. It's actually what we call an innovation because Allah did not deem it important. It's yeah. like us adding something that wasn't given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, one point that Brother Amil made here is that you're right, that when we break it down, all regulations are from Allah. But we also understand as a Muslim ummah, all of us, that whatever the Prophet does is actually what Allah wants. So we can look at it from the perspective that if the Prophet likes something, or if the Prophet dislikes something, because Allah said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ أَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ So we know that no matter how we cut it, whether we want to break it down to say, no, the Prophet did not appoint him for his own personal gains, right? And we, and we agree with that. But the fundamental principle still stands that what, even if the Prophet were to appoint for his quote-unquote personal gains, we would argue that that is the divine law. For Allah says the divine law is even when you married more than one wife, if you want them, you can keep. If you don't want them, it's up to you because it all becomes part of the Sharia. By the way, just to just to jump in there, one yeah. one point I want to mention, then inshallah you can continue. Is you know you're having the discussion on did the Prophet appoint Imam Ali alayhi salam as you know wali or Khalifa? And by the way, of this hadith of Khadir Kum, as as Brother Ali Khalfan mentioned, it's extremely. Um, reported in the books of our, even our, our Sunni brothers and sisters. But there's often a discussion on, well, what does Mawla mean? Because we know the hadith says, Man kuntu mawla, fahada aliyun mawla. That whomsoever is Mawla I am, then Ali is as Mawla. And they, some people have the contention because firstly, the hadith is indisputable, right? By several, several narrators from different companions, it is as authentic as the hadith get. This, this event of Ghadir al Now the contention becomes, okay, this event did happen. Now, what happened at this event? We know in the last Hajj of the Prophet, the Hajjat al Wida, in the last few months of his life, in the 10th year after Hijrah, in fact, just two or three months before the Prophet passes away, as we know, he passed away in Safar. He's going back after completing Hajj and he's traveling and he stops by this pond, you know, Ghadir Qum, and he gets on a pulpit, they say, in front of tens of thousands of companions and he begins to talk and he mentions, Man kuntu mawla, fahada ali mawla. And now some people may say, okay, well, per perhaps mawla means friend. Okay, Mawla means friend. Some people say, well, you know, there was a dispute between Imam Ali and Khalid ibn Walid in Yemen and the Prophet had to get up to, to, to tell everyone that no, 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 Ali is my friend and you have to know this. But we have to look at the context. It's always important to look at the context of the statement of the Prophet. If you look at the actual wordings of the Hadith, take a few few words before the Hadith. Before the Prophet says, Man kuntu Mawla, fahada Ali and Mawla. In order to understand what does Mawla mean? Does it mean friend here? Because as yes, of course, in Arabic, Every word can have several meanings, but it depends on the context, depends on the usage, who's saying it, who are they addressing it to. So let's look at the context of man kuntu mawla fahada ali al mawla. If we take the hadith before it, right? Right before, what did the Prophet say? He says, Ya ayyuhannas, O mankind, 
ان الله مولاي وانا مولى المؤمنين وانا اولى بهم من انفسهم من كنت مولى فهذا علي مولى now in this context the same word mola is being used for allah meaning allah is your mola over you i am your mola and then wa ana waliyun bihim min anfusihim and i am your wali over you over yourselves and so are we to suppose by the way the same word mola is used again right man kuntu mola fa hadha ali mola the word mola is used throughout the sentence and so now we're to say okay allah is my friend the prophet in the middle of a barren desert right in front of tens of thousands of people decides to get up to tell everyone remind them that god is your friend i am your friend and then wa ana aula bihim min anfusihim what does that mean the verse of the quran an nabi aula right bil mu'minina min anfusihim that the prophet has greater authority that's what it means not the prophet is more of a friend to you than you are to yourself the prophet has more authority over you than you have to yourself so if we look at the context of the word maula the word wali here allah has more authority over you i have authority over you over yourselves and then whomsoever i have that authority over man kuntu maulahu fahada ali al maulan by the way look at the same conjunction used here allah prophet imam ali alayhi salam is the same as the verse of the quran ayat al wilaya 555 inna ma waliyukum allah wa rasuluhu wal ladina amanu al ladina yuqimuna as salata wa yu'tuna az zakata wa hum raqiun that allah is your wali and so is the prophet the same and is used conjunction no different no different usages god is your wali and his messenger and wal ladina amanu al ladina yuqimuna as salata not every believer Sp the specific believer that fits this criteria wal ladina amanu he believes al ladina yuqimuna as salata wa yu'tuna az zakata he establishes prayer and yu'tuna az zakata wa hum raqiun you, you and know gives you, charity while in ruku you know what baffles me is how much we 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 we're bringing all this evidence right how much people resist the elephant in the room right and then they all argue about the importance of leadership and then they will appoint people in a very ancillary cursory way or this you know companion passed by the prophet the prophet looked at him okay so he should be the khalifa and you you, you work so hard to negate what allah has established but yet you work so hard to establish those who haven't been given credence that's the irony of the whole equation here we realize the importance of divine leadership perpetually not up to the end of the prophet's life and i've given this example when people say to me why do we have an imam today who's hidden what good is he you know isn't the prophet enough okay and and you will notice that according to the quran of course the leader is always existent on earth in mijailun fil ardi khalifa we all know that even iblis knows that that's why he asked till the day of judgment it's not a secret but we as a social community in the in the socio economic world we realize that even when a president of a country let's say george washington was the was one of the founding fathers of this country and we understand his vision and when he died why did we need another president there was no need we could have all just stuck with the vision of george washington and maintained the americas the way george washington was thinking or how about when a big company like apple or google you know with the founders of those when they die you know we should say well let's just linger on the thoughts of the founders and then we will become uh, you know we we can live by those standards and what what you what you find is that it's not it's there's always a need for an existent leader so so the notion of leadership the reality of leadership is so conspicuously prevalent and it's so glaring at us in the eye that i'm always um surprised why human beings work so hard to you know devalue these extremely important events upon which the messenger of allah established and by the way one quick point you know ghadir was the finality of appointment it wasn't the first appointment imam ali alayhi salam was appointed in the house of abu talib even Muhammad Hussein Haikal who's written the book called Al Hayat Muhammad the life of Muhammad he was a famous Egyptian historian who died at the last his last book was copyrighted in 1976 you find in it he talks about the the feast of Dhul Ashira and the prophet is asking who will be my inheritor my successor my helper right and Imam Ali alayhi salam stands up three times as a young boy 
And the Prophet takes him after the third time and says, bear witness all of you that he is my wali, he's my successor. So what I'm trying to explain is that it, it didn't come at Ghadir's for you and I to have like, oh, really? You know, maybe it was, it was you know, friend. Maybe it was Fulan bin Fulan who was, you know, not having a good relationship with him. Why are we barking up the wrong tree to devalue that which is equivalent to devaluing Salah? Exactly. It's like saying, you know, I don't know. Is prayer really there? Is fasting really there? Is the belief in Allah really there? We're starting to throw, you know, wool over people's eyes on this matter. And I think it's it's imperative that we understand the gravity of this relationship that all five schools of thought agree. Leadership after the Prophet is pivotal. The difference is the school of Ahlul Bayt insists Allah and the Prophet appointed. The other schools say there was no appointment and it was left for us to decide on how it should be. I mean, do the math. It's equivalent to saying Allah never taught us how to pray, but we figured it's important. So we all had a shura and we decided one way or 10 ways of praying. It, that's the absurdity of this conversation. And why am I saying this? Because it, this leads to treachery. It leads to Karbala. It leads to ISIS. It leads to all kinds of problems. And I'm not accusing any school of thought. All of us in all five schools of thought have an obligation to obey Allah and the Messenger and those vested with authority after them. Yeah, I just want to mention something interesting. Um, when when some people say that uh, the Prophet did not appoint a leader, let's, let's say he did not appoint a leader. We can show therefore from the Quran that if he did not appoint, then you have no right to appoint as well. Now I'll show you the verse. It's verse number 36 in chapter number 33. When Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ meaning, meaning, and it, we, it does not behoove a believing man or a believing woman to have any say after Allah and his messenger have decided on a matter. matter. So let us say the prophet decided not to appoint. The verse is saying that you do not have any right to make the appointment. But the fact is that leadership, as you mentioned, Brother name is important. And therefore, are you trying to tell us that the Prophet did not know that leadership after him is so important that he did not appoint? That's one thing I want to mention. Another point I want to mention very quickly, I won't take much time, is the verse 55 in Surah Maida. Brother Amil, you recited, Brother Asnain, you recited, many people know that verse. In the waliyukum Allah wa Rasul. Allah Tabai says that the word wilaya is in singular. Allah did not say innama awliya ukumullah. What does it mean? It means that the wilaya of Allah and the wilaya, sorry, the wilaya of the one who gives charity in the state of Ruku springs from the messenger's wilaya. And that of the messenger springs from Allah's wilaya. It's a single project. It's not like, you know, the way people have explained the wilaya in the sense of helping, for example, and friendship. You know, some commentators, Allah quotes them, they have say that the wilaya in this verse is in the sense of helping. And Allah proves from the Quran that there is nowhere in the Quran where Allah has ever mentioned that the Prophet is supposed to help the believers in the cause of Islam. Even at the time of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, when Nabi Isa alayhi salam perceived disbelief among his people, what did he say? Ansari illallah, who are my helpers toward the cause of Allah? He did not say, I am your helper. So the believers are supposed to help the messenger. So the rely in the sense of helping does not make sense in the verse. And it's, it's very, very clear that the rely mentions is in the sense of leadership and guardianship, which we have shown that it is so necessary. And without that, the religion of Islam is incomplete, it's not perfect. It's like the nucleus has been removed. And the completion of Allah's favor, sorry, is the addition of the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'minin to the religion that made the religion of Islam perfect. And speaking of wilaya, somebody has to hold that position. All five schools of thought agree that somebody held the position. We as the lovers of Ahlul Bayt say Imam Ali alayhi salam always held it until it went to Imam Hassan, to Imam Hussein, Imam Zain al-Abidin. They always held it, regardless of what the, the, the politics of the time was. That divine ordinance is not negotiable. 
nor can it be thrown like a soccer ball on somebody's field into their laps and say, okay, you hold it for the moment. As Imam Radha alayhi salam says, Imam Ali alayhi salam also says, you know, where, where, where Mamun, for example, gets on the on the pulpit and says to Imam Radha that I have concluded that this, this Khilafa doesn't belong to me. It's like a ball, you know. I don't want the ball anymore. I'm going to throw it on your lap now. You know how ridiculous, right? And Imam Radha says to him, well, if you've concluded, then why are you sitting there, number one? And since it's not yours, who authorized you to give it to me? Subhanallah. The wisdom of Imam. So when we go back to the wilaya issue and leadership issue, it's based on merit. So when you and I are going to have ambiguity, whether it was friendship, whether it was helping, was the Prophet implying wilaya means, you know, supporting, helping. Ask any Muslim, what do you think of the Holy Prophet in your belief? Is he somebody who's ancillary that you can play with and dangle with, where one day the Prophet is important, the next day he's not important? I'll tell you all as a Muslim that if you and I even dare to do that, you are teetering on the borderline of calling yourself a Muslim. For you cannot say, well, the Prophet didn't really have total authority on me. There are schools of thought outside of the five major schools of thought that believe that the Quran is only important. The Prophet is not important. There is that attempt to even marginalize, marginalize the Prophet. And what do we as a Muslim community say? The minute you marginalize, you are now tearing the nucleus driving force of guidance as the Quran is clearly established. What is important to point here is it's based on merit. And with all due respect, I beg to ask the entire world on earth, even non-Muslims, even people like George Jordak, even people like Kofi Annan, who led the United Nations, ask them, when it comes to merit, even 14 centuries later, who holds the banner of merit after the Holy Prophet? Kofi Annan says, if there is a man who the whole Middle East should follow, it's Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, from the mere one letter that he wrote to Malik Ashtar when he appointed him the governor of Egypt. Simple as that. So when you and I look at merit base, Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala, it's merit. Imam Zainul Abidin, when he climbs up those pieces of wood and he speaks to Yazid and his cronies in that court, he said, what is your merit? What is my merit? Who do, who do I come from? What is my family? What is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that, right? In Allah stafa adama wa no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, one on top of the other. What does that mean? Are we going to just turn a blind eye to that and say, it doesn't matter. We're going to look at what happened historically because God wanted certain kind of history. If that's the case, then did Allah want the history of Fir'aun? Did Allah want the, the history of Hitler? Nobody can say such the, is the case. Merit. And, I'm, and in the end, inshallah, before we end here, we're going to talk about the merit. Look at the Najul Balagha alone. And the wise statements of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Besides the enormous love the Prophet had for Imam Ali alayhi salam, the authority given to him, the brotherhood, even in Medina, the Prophet only took Imam Ali alayhi salam as his brother, whereas he should have taken an Ansar because technically he was a Muhajir. No, he took Imam Ali alayhi salam. If you and I are going to turn a blind eye to all of the above, and it's stacked so big, it's bigger than a mountain, and you and I are going to refuse to see the elephant in the room, no problem. Allah says, يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسِمْ بِإِمَامِهِمْ on judgment day, Allah will raise you with your imam. Because at the end of the day, if I'm going to turn a blind eye to such conspicuous nature of an individual where you really have to go out of this universe to convince even a simple-minded human being that Ali ibn Abi Talib had less credentials than anybody else after the Prophet. I mean, I, and, I, and I'm saying this with all due respect. Even the, the second caliph said, Lawla Ali halak Umar. Had it not been for Ali, Umar would have been destroyed. You know, just just to jump in there on that point of really, I think when for someone to really come forward and state that, you know, the Holy Prophet did not appoint a successor after him, did not appoint someone to lead the Muslims after his death. To me, honestly, in my opinion, when I look at that and I hear such a statement, that's an insult to the intelligence of the Holy Prophet. That really is an insult. I mean, every average human being on earth can figure out the importance of leadership. No country runs without a president. No, you know, company runs without a CEO and no CEO, no tyrant king even. The most ruthless tyrant kings with not even half an intellect, half a brain can figure out that after them, they need to appoint their son or the CEO. Even if the CEO, by the way, is not going to appoint himself, 
He has a you know the board of directors in place who are going to appoint the next CEO, right? There's always some system of leadership. I mean, to say that the Holy Prophet, by the way, an individual, and Shia Sunni, we agree all unanimously that the Holy Prophet gave us everything that we needed to function as humanity, right? Islam is a complete religion. Islam is a perfect religion. Islam is the perfect, the way the Holy Prophet left it for us. So if the Holy Prophet did not leave a leader behind, I mean, that is like saying, I mean, just to, even a basic logical argument, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, even, even Bukhari, by the way, mentions that the people used to come to the Prophet and ask him about, you know, the most particular issues. They even say in Bukhari, by the way, the person used to come to the Prophet and ask him, you know, what's the cure for diarrhea? Imagine, they used to come to the Prophet to ask him for medical advice. But yet somehow, in the 40 years before his message, in the 23 years after when he's proclaiming Islam, you're telling me no one, never was it ever arisen to any human being alive that, oh, by the way, even if, by the way, even if we're to suppose the Prophet didn't appoint himself, you were to say that no one had the, the brains to ask the Holy Prophet, oh, by the way, you know, if you are to die, who is going to be the next leader? Who is going to take over after? I mean, that to me is is so baffling. And the fact, by the way, last point, brother, saying you can jump in there is, okay, let's say, by the way, the Holy Prophet do, did not appoint, right? And let's say it was left to Shura. Let's say it was left to Shura. Then at least the Holy Prophet should have given us a template. Okay, exactly. this is how you do Shura. What are the this is how you need to do it. What the are criteria, the criteria? Yeah. Give, me, give me a set of standards to apply. Exactly. And why are why is everyone using a different criteria? By the way, Abu Bakr can figure out that he needs to appoint Uthman after him. But then Uthman uses a different strategy. He says, oh, no, I can't appoint. I need to appoint six people who have to appoint themselves. You know, Talha, Imam Ali, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, a different criteria. Muawiyah can figure out he needs to appoint Yazid after him. But the Holy Prophet couldn't figure it out. And he was still left to sure, at least tell me how I should appoint. Should it be one direct appointment? Should it be a council? No, no such, no such principles given. That to me is is an insult to the intelligence of the. And Holy by Prophet. the way, and by the way, if there is a shura as we claim, then why are we not appointing someone now? We don't have a Khalifa now. You know, we've got Twitter, we've got technology. You know, how, why is the Muslim world not voting? And even if we were to enact voting, uh, and assuming we even limit to the Quraysh, which is ridiculous because it's not a national choice. You know, it's not a borderline choice. It's a divine choice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintains, you know, min shajaratin mubarak din zaytunatin la shalqiyatin wala gharbiya. It's a blessed tree of prophethood that God appoints even with imamat. But assuming we did have shura, then let's have a shura now. What I'm saying is, even if you go to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who is the imam of one of the four major schools of thought, he calls Imam Ali alayhi salam, karram allahu waj. Okay, he says he's not really Allah. You don't call him radiallahu. I mean, may God be pleased with him. Karram Allah was because he never worshipped or bowed to any idol. His status, his relationship with the Messenger of Allah is bar none, with all due respect to everybody else. And we're not in this conversation to belittle other groups. We're not in this conversation to belittle other people. It's almost like I need to go for surgery and I'm going to find the best surgeon. I'm not going to find a second class surgeon or I'm going to find somebody who happened to be affiliated in medicine. I'm going to find the best surgeon who's going to work on me physically. Can you imagine spiritually that affects my akhirah and dunya? No. No, the merit here is, is, is extremely important for you and I. As a Muslim ummah, you and I should ask, who has the merit? Today we have a president who doesn't have merit, with all due respect. But he's a president. Does it mean now historically we have to accept the quality of such presidency in the future that we teach our children that there was once a president who did A, B, and C that is sort of repulsive? Then we should say to us, it's okay, but that's the standard of presidency that also is, is now part and parcel of our democratic system. We should say, no, we have to improve the quality of our leadership so that our children inherit the best, highest moral conduct because it's the leaders who ultimately set the standards of society. So in, in conclusion to this, before we end, inshallah, but Ali, you can also make your final point on this, why we're having this discussion. We are not here to hash out or discuss this, who's right and who's wrong. We are here to hash out the necessity, the importance of us zoning in and honing in on the most crucial leaders that will save our dunya and akhara. If you and I, if the, if the Prophet of Allah is in the room, and he has 50 companions around him who are all good. The minute I look at the companions and I ignore the prophet, my akhirah is on the line. I want us to know that. 
If I'm in the room and I'm looking for guidance and I know this is the Prophet of Allah and I look at his companions and I look at anyone other than the Prophet, my Akhirah could be questionable because now I'm looking at secondary matters and not the primary leadership. It's almost like saying, I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to learn morality through other religions. But I'm not going to focus on the one that God revealed to me. I may read some of it, but it's not central to me. It's uh, referential to me. Guess what? You may, be, you may end up collecting the wrong set of ideas and you will miss bullseye. I think that's the conversation we're having. Here, it's all about self-improvement. It's about saving our own souls and about what we're sending tomorrow, right? And I think it's very important. This conversation is not about Sunni Shia. It's not about A versus B. It's about truth versus lack thereof. Simple as that. And if you and I are going to turn a blind eye to that, you know, then you and I are in serious trouble. When I talk, when I was reading the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we mentioned this in Tawrat, we mentioned this in Zabur, we told the people of the book this. Why is Allah talking that way? Because Allah is saying, I did not leave them alone. I guided them too, but they rejected it. They rejected it. Hence today, they're confused. The other day, there was Jay Dyer having a debate with Shabir Hassan Ali. You know, I was watching it. And Jay Dyer is talking about how God, you know, Jesus had two sides to him. He had the divine side and the human side. And only the human side is the one that got crucified because the divine side doesn't go through change. But the divine side merged with the human side. And I'm watching this for 30 minutes and I'm shaking my head and saying, how did you get there? You're such an intelligent guy. How did you get there? And he admits, by the way, Jay Dyer says, you know, Islam has the upper hand in the West because it makes more sense. He's also admitting to this. What I'm trying to say is even intelligent people will get duped if they misconstrue early on belief systems where it now takes them into areas where now they have to defend something that is just not defensible. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, we're running out of time, but in conclusion, I mentioned before that imam or leadership comes under the umbrella of wilaya. And the criteria for imam is clearly mentioned in the Quran. You know, Brother Snein, you were talking about, you know, the merit before, you know, who, who, who has the right merits to become a leader. So when Ibrahim salam, was made an imam, he, he says to Allah, Qala wa min and Allah replies, Qala la yanalu That's the criteria. The imam will be given to some of your progeny, but it will not be given to the unjust. And I think I did mention once that what Allah is implying here is about that group of people who did not do injustice from the beginning of their life up to the end of their life. And a good example is Amir al-Mu'mineen. And one more thing I want to mention is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, haq Ali ma'al haq wa haq ma'al Ali. Ali is with the truth and the truth is with Ali. Now, taking this into consideration, you'll find that for some of us, it becomes very, very easy to talk about Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, to describe him about his adherence to truth and justice. And the reason why it becomes easy for us is because we align ourselves with truth and justice. But the problem is when we try to follow him. You know, to speak about him is easy, but to follow him becomes very, very difficult. How to remain steadfast and how to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that we promote justice in the society. If we concentrate on promoting justice and truth in the society, it becomes very easy then to follow Amir al-Mumin. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult. So it's not only about speaking about Ali ibn Abi Talib, but also about a strategy that we need to develop in order to follow him the way he should be followed. Thank you. So, you know, we're out of time. So just as a final concluding point, you know, on this discussion of leadership, one final point I wanted to mention, you know, we were discussing, you know, whether the prophet appointed a leader or successor after him. Let's, let's quickly just in one or two minutes, look at the life of the prophet. And if he ever appointed leaders or people to manage, you know, a city or an army, when he was to leave town. If you look, for example, Battle of Hunain, when the Prophet leaves for the Battle of Hunain, did he appoint someone to take care of the city of Mecca? Yes, he did. He appointed a 20-year-old by the name of Itab bin Usayt to take care of the city of Medina. 
When the Prophet is going on the expedition of Tabuk, does he just leave the city of Medina by himself, by itself? He says, oh, the people will take care of themselves. No. He appoints Imam Ali alayhi salam to take care of the city of Medina. When the Prophet goes Hijrah, he leaves for Medina, from Mecca. Does he appoint someone to, you know, manage his affairs in Mecca and bring the women, you know, to back to, uh, towards Medina? Yes, he appoints Imam Ali So the Holy Prophet in his own life, whenever he used to leave a city, he used to appoint someone to lead the city, to manage the city, because he recognizes basic common sense, leadership, leadership, leadership. You need someone to manage, but yet he's going to leave this world, right? He's going to leave this world, yet he doesn't appoint. That to me is, is completely inexplainable. And you know, the consequences of not having leadership, just the final point as we end, and Brasnan, you touched upon this. The consequence of having no leadership is the fact that you and I go astray. You want to see the consequence of not having proper leadership? Look at Karbala, look at the Battle of Sifin, you know, you say, Hasbuna Kitabullah, the book of Allah is sufficient. The people who killed Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, were Hufal of the Quran. People who fought Imam Ali Salam and Safin had the Quran on the spears. You know, they knew the Quran. So what's the difference? The difference is when the Prophet says, Inni tarikum fikum thaqalain, Kitabullah wa itrati ahl bayti ma in tamasaktum bihima lan tadillu ba'di abada. I leave behind the Quran, the two heavyweighty things, Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. If you hold on to them both together, you will never go astray after what was a problem. You take one, you leave the other, and then you start to have problems. And that's why we truly, we say, and we conclude on this, you know, on this auspicious occasion of Eid al-Ghadi, that Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. That surely we praise and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance and for the blessing of, you know, especially the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam, really the, the perfection of the religion of Islam. And if it were not for the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then truly you and I would not have, uh, you know, you, not, you and I would not have a trajectory on how to properly function as human beings. So inshallah, on that, I think we will conclude tonight's program with a short dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana aghfir lana wa li ikhwani la ladhina sabakuna bil iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla la ladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka ra'oof ar-Rahim. Thank you, uh, Brother Ali, for, for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of our viewers. Eid Mubarak to everybody. May Allah bless you all. And remember, we all follow the footsteps of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uh, he is that gate that the Prophet left as the guardian of the city of knowledge. Let's not forget that. And congratulations to the human race for civility and the, the success of humanity is, was, is hinging on that appointment of Ghadir. People may not understand it, but inshallah they will. Inshallah. inshallah. And it's not, and it's as you mentioned, Brother saying it's merit based. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said it best. In al Khilafa Lam to Zayyin Aliyan, Bal Aliyun Zayyanaha. That it's not the position of Khilafa that gave Imam Ali his merit. In yeah. fact, it is Imam Ali Islam who gave honor to the position of Khilafa due to his merit and stature. Inshallah. Thank with you. that, we will conclude tonight's program. Wassalamu alaikum, Jamia wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam.